Book Four, Chapter Eight of Clara Vaughan, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. Clara Vaughan, Volume Two by R. D. Blackmore. Book Four, Chapter Eight. Chapter 8 My uncle's tale, as repeated here, will no more be broken either by my interruptions, which were frequent enough, or by his own pauses, but will be presented in a continuous form. Story of Edgar Vaughan On the following day, when I called at the house in Bloomsbury, then a fashionable neighbourhood to which I had been directed, I was met at the threshold with power and warmth by Peter Green himself, an old acquaintance of mine, who proved to be Adelaide's brother. My nature had been too reserved for me to be friendly with him at college, but I had liked him much better than anyone else, because he was so decided and straightforward. The meeting rather surprised me, for Green is not a rare name and so it had never occurred to me to ask the weary Adelaide whether she knew one Peter Green, a first-classman of Christchurch. Peter, who was a most hearty fellow and full, like his sister, of animal life, overpowered me with the weight of his gratitude, which I did not at all desire or deserve. As, in spite of your rash conclusion, my romantic Clara, I did not fall in love with Adelaide, who, besides her pithsome health and vigour, was in many respects astray from my fair ideal, and more than all was engaged long ago to the giver of the sapphire ring. I need not enlarge upon my friendship with Peter Green, whom I now began to like in real earnest. Young as he was, his father's recent death had placed him at the head of a leading mercantile house, Green, Vowler and Green of little distaff lane and young as he was not more than seven and twenty his manners were formed and his character and opinions fixed as if he had seen all the ways and taken stock of the sentiments of all the civilized world present to him any complexity any conflict of probabilities any maze whose ins and outs were abroad half over the universe and if the question were practical he would see what to do in a moment. If it were theoretical, he would quietly move it aside. I have known many learned judges sum up a case most lucidly, blow away all the verbiage, balance the contradictions, illuminate all the obscurities, and finally lift from its matrix and lay in the colourless sunlight the virgin truth, without either dross or polish. All this Peter Green seemed to have done in a moment, without any effort, without any reasoning process, not jumping at his conclusion, but making it fly to him. He possessed what an ancient writer once highly esteemed at Oxford, entitles the wit universal, which confers and comprises the wit of details. For this power, when applied to a practical purpose, a great historian employs a happy expression not welcomed by our language. He calls it the power to pontoon the emergency. Excuse my harsh translation, perhaps it is better than paraphrase. With all these business qualities, my friend was a merry and unpretentious a man as ever made a bad joke or laughed at another fellow's liberal also, warm-hearted, and not sarcastic. In a word, he was a genuine specimen of the noble English merchant, who has done more to raise this country in the esteem of the world than would a thousand Nelsons or Wellingtons. Now this man discerned at a glance the wretched defects of my nature and position. An active mind like his could never believe in the possibility of being happy without occupation and by occupation he meant not the chasing of butterflies or maundering after foxes 
but real honest Anglo-Saxon work, work that strings the muscles or knits the hemispheres of the brain, and work he would himself, ay, and with all his energies. Not the man was he to tap the table with his pipe and cry out, Bravo, Altiora! A little more gin, if you please, and chalk it down to the strike. But he was the man to throw off his coat and pitch into the matter before him without many words, though with plenty of thought. Now this man, feeling deeply indebted to me, and beginning to like me as my apathy and reserve went to pieces before his energy, this man, I say, cast about for some method of making me useful and happy. Wonderfully swift as he was in pouncing upon the right thing, I believe it took him at least five minutes to find out the proper course for an impractical fellow like me. And when he had found this out, it took even him a week to draw the snail out of his hole. Years of agreeable indolence and calm objective indifference, seldom ruffled except at fashionable snobbery, had made of me not a sybarite or a supercilious censor, much less a waiter on fortune, but a contemplative islander, a Haitian who had been once to Spain and would henceforth be satisfied with the view of her caravels. But my adelantado was a man of gold and iron. Green, Vowler and Green were largely concerned in the oil and dried fruit business. They had ransacked the olive districts of continental Europe and found the price going up and the quality going down, so they wanted now to open another oil vein. Peter Green, observing my love of uncultured freedom, the only subject on which I ever grew warm and rapturous, espied the way to relieve me of some nonsense, give my slow life a fillip, and perhaps, O oh, climax, open a lucrative connection. He knew, for he seemed to know everything, done or undone by commerce, that there was a glorious island rich in jewels and marble and every dower of nature, and above all, teeming with olives, lemons and grapes and citrons, and that this gifted island still remained a stranger through French and Genoese ignorance to our London trade. This was the island libelled by Seneca, idolised by its natives, drenched with more blood than all the plains of Imathia, yet mother of heroes and conquerors of the world, if that be any credit, in a single word, Corsica. Once or twice, indeed, our countrymen have attempted to shake hands with this noble race, so ruined by narrow tradition, and in the end we shall doubtless succeed, as we always do, but the grain of the Corsican is almost as stubborn as our own. In fact, the staple is much the same, the fabric is very different. Bold they are and manly, simple, generous and most hospitable, lovers too of their country beyond all other nations, but oh, fatal ignorance! Industry to them is drudgery and labour is an outrage. Worse than all is the fiend of the island, the cursed blood revenge. Just the place for you, Vaughan, said the indomitable Peter. Everyone there is dignified as an eagle after stealing a lamb. No institutions to speak of but the natural one of vendetta. Splendid equality, majestic manhood, lots of true womanhood, and it does all the work that is done, which isn't saying much. Why, my dear Quixotic, the land of San Piero and Paoli, and where Rousseau was to legislate, only he proved too lazy, is not that the jockey for you? After all these levees and masquerades that you so much delight in, you need not scowl like a bandit. It is only because they don't want you. You are just the same as the rest. Or why do you notice the nonsense? After all, this London frippery, Monte Catondo, will be a fresh oyster after deviled biscuits. True enough, my friend, but an oyster to be swallowed, shell and all. 
Well, is not that just what you want? Lime is good for squeamishness, and more than that, you are just the man we want. You can talk Italian with excellent opera style and sentiment, and you won't be long till you fraternize with the Corsicans. Perhaps they will drive out the French, who don't know what to do with it, and make you their king like Theodore of Nukov, and then you proclaim free trade restricted to the navy of green, Vowler and Green. But in sober earnest, think of it, my dear Vaughan, anything is better than this cynic indolence. Some of your views will be corrected, and all enlarged by travel. A common sentiment, yes, the very thing you are short of. All your expenses we pay, of course, and give you an honest salary, and all we ask of you is to explore more than a tourist would, and to send us a plain description of everything. You have plenty of observation. Make it useful instead of a torment to you. We know well enough the great gifts of that island, but we want to know how they lie, and how we may best get at them. Then you would expect me to make commercial arrangements. Peter laughed outright. I should rather fancy not. Somewhat queer ones they would be. Platonic, no doubt, and panisic, but not altogether adapted to double entry. Then, in fact, I am to go as a committee of inquiry. I have told you all we want. If you make any friends, all the better, but that we leave to yourself. Perhaps you'll grow sociable there, Though the Corsican does not sing we won't go home till morning and be going home all the time. And how long would my engagement last? Till you have thoroughly traversed the country, if you stick to it so long, and then if you quit yourself well, we should commission you for Sardinia. What an opening for an idle man, though it would soon kill me, so little to do. But you may cut it short when you like. Plenty of our people would jump at such an offer, but for a country like that we must have a thorough gentleman. A coarse-mannered bagman would very soon secure the contents of a fusil. He would be kissing the Corsican girls who are wonderfully lovely, they say, and their lovers amazingly jealous, and every man carries a gun. A timid man they despise, an insolent man they shoot, and most of our fellows are one or the other or both. But will you undertake it, yes or no, on the spot, and I ask you to say yes as a special favour to me? Then of course I say yes. When shall I go? Tomorrow, if you like. Next month, if you prefer it. We can give you introductions. There is no real danger for a thorough gentleman, or you should not go for all the olives in Europe. Mind, we want a particular sort, very long and taper, Virgil's ray, in fact. You shall have a sample of it. As yet, we know but one district of Italy where it grows, but have got scent of it in Corsica. Glorious fellows they are, if half that I hear is true. Glorious fellows, but for their laziness, and that vendetta. To be brief, I received very clear instructions in writing and was off for Bonifacio the following week, in a small swift yacht of my own, a luxury to which I had always aspired, and which I could now for a time afford. But before I went, your poor father, Clara, protested most strongly against the scheme, and even came to London in the vain hope of dissuading me. He had some deep presentiment that it would end darkly, and so indeed it did. Ned, said he once more, there are only two of us, and my dear wife is very delicate. I have been at Genoa, where those islanders are well known, and even there they are rarely spoken of, but with a cold shudder. They are a splendid race, I believe, great heroes and all that, but they shoot a man with no more compunction than they shoot a muffro. I implore you, my dear brother, not to risk the last of our family, where blood flows as freely as water. And your temper, you know, is not the best in the world. Don't go, my dear fellow, don't go. I shall have to come and avenge you, and I don't understand vendetta. Ah, me, if I had only listened to him, and yet I don't know. 
After a pleasant voyage, we reached the magnificent island about the middle of May. My intention was to skirt round it from the southern extremity, taking the western side first and touching at every anchorage, whence I would make incursions and return to my little cutter as the most convenient headquarters. Of course I should have to rough it, but what young man would think twice of that with an adventurous life before him? I will not weary you, my dear child, with a long description of Corsica. It is a land which combines all the softness and the majesty, all the wealth and barrenness, all the smile and menace of all the world beside. I could talk of it by the hour, but you want to know what I did and was done to more than what I saw. From the awful rock of Bonifacio, the streets where men should have no elbows, and the tower of Torrione, along the fantastic coast, which looks as if time were a giant rabbit, we trace the blue and spur-vexed sea, now edged with white, and now with grey, and now with glowing red, until we reach that paradise of heaven, the garden of Balagna. End of Book 4, Chapter 8four of chapter nine of clara vaughan volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sandra clara vaughan volume two by r d blackmore book four chapter nine Chapter 9 Story of Edgar Vaughan Let me hold myself, weak as I am and crippled by premature old age, not the shortness of my breath, not the numbness of my heart, not even the palsy of my frame, can quench or check the fire rekindled by the mere name of that heavenly valley. To live there only half a minute is worth a day of English life, life. It is a space to measure, not by pendulum or clock hand, not by our own strides to and fro, the ordnance scale of the million, not even by the rolling sun and nature's hail and farewell, but by the wellspring of ourselves, the fount of thought and feeling. Every single breath I draw of this living air, air the bride of earth our sire, wedded to him by God creator, heir whose mother milk we fight for in clusters balking one another. Every breath I draw dances with a buoyant virtue, sucked in any other land but from mountain nipples. Bright air of a rosy blue, where northern eyes are dazed with beauty, where every flower cuts stars of light and every cloud is sunshine step. Can even lovers parted thus believe themselves divided? Every rock has its myrtle favour, every tree its clematis wreath. Under the sisters an oleander hides the pink to lace its bodice, watched by the pansy's sprightly eye. Lavishly as children's bubbles, hover overhead oranges and citrons, lemons, almonds, figs, varied by the blushing peach in the purpling grape. Far behind and leaning forth, the swarthy bosom of the mountain, whose white head leans on the heaven, are ranks on ranks of Glaucus olive, giants of a green old age, dashed with silver grey. And oh, the fragrance underfoot, the tribute of the ground, which Corsica's great sun, as we men measure greatness, pined for in the barren isle, where the iron of his selfishness entered his own soul. These are said to be the largest olive trees in the world, and of the very best varieties. Heaps upon heaps the rich fruit lies at the foot of the glorious tree. Nature is too bountiful for man to heed her gifts. For this district of Balagna and that of Nebio, further north, 
my attention had been especially bespoken by my shrewd and sagacious friend. Therefore, and by reason of the charms around me, here I resolved to pass the summer, so my vessel was laid up at Calvi, and being quartered in Belgodere, at a little inn, Locanda, it should be called, but I hate interlarding. I addressed myself right heartily to business and to pleasure. First, I had to study the grand Palladian gift. Unless old Seneca was, as the course can say, a great liar, he cannot have been the author of that epigram which declares this land a stranger to the peaceful boon. It is impossible to believe that a country so adapted to that tree, so often colonised by cultured races, can have been so long ungifted with its staff of life. The island itself in that same epigram is utterly misdescribed. As regards the inhabitants, the first line of the well-known couplet is verified by ages. To the second it does not plead guilty now, and probably never did. Law, the first revenge. Law, the second, to live by robbery. Law, the third, to lie. The fourth, to deny any gods. The Corsicans, on the contrary, have always been famous for candour, whose very soul is truth and for superstition, the when or hump of religion. For my own part, loving not that unprincipled fellow hard labour, towards whom these noble islanders entertain a like antipathy, and loving much any freedom not hostile to my own, I got on with the natives admirably for a certain time. Time had reconciled me to their customs of carrying, instead of cane or umbrella, long double-barrelled guns, whose muzzle they afford the stranger full opportunity of inspecting. First-rate marksmen are they, but they sling their guns at haphazard on their backs, and cheek to jowl we come upon the cold metal at the corner of the narrow streets. Tall and powerful men they are, especially the mountaineers, with all the Spaniard's dignity and the Italian's native grace. The women are lithe, erect, and beautifully formed, with a swan-like carriage and a free and courteous bearing, such as very few of our high-born damsels own. Labour in Probus of Virgil the olive growers, frankly, gave me all their little information about that tree, whose typical virtues they have never cared to learn. The variety chiefly grown, or rather, which chiefly grows itself, is one they call the Genoese. The owners afford them very little culture, and many are too idle, even to collect the fruit. There are said to be ten million olive trees in the island, at least they were reckoned up to that number, by order of the government, then the enumerators grew tired and left off counting. Whatever number there is might easily be tripled, if any one had the energy to graft the oleasters, with which the hills are covered. There is also the Saracen olive and the Sabine, the latter perhaps the Regia of Columella, Rajaria of Caesalpinus and Radius of Virgil. However, though not unlike my sample fruit, it was not quite identical, and as my employers wanted a very special sort for very special qualities, I was as far from my object as ever. One magnificent summer evening, as I rode along the mountainside near the village of Spelon Cato, suddenly the track turned sharply into a wooded dingle. Steeped in the dream of nature's beauty, I was thinking of nothing at all, as becomes a true Corsican, when I received a sharpish knock in the eye. Something fell and lodged in my capacious beard, smarting from the pain. I caught it, and not being able to see clearly, took it at first for a spent and dropping bullet. But when my eyes had ceased to water, I found in my hand a half-grown olive, of the very kind I had so long been seeking. 
I drew forth some of my London specimens which had been chemically treated to prevent their shriveling and compared it narrowly. Yes, there could be no doubt. The same pyriform curve, the same bulge near the peduncle, the same violet lines in the skin, and when cut open, the same granulation and nucleus. I was truly delighted. At length I should be of some real service, at least if there were many trees here of this most rare variety. By riding up the dingle, I soon ascertained that it was planted with trees of this sort only, grey old trees of a different habit from any other olive. Afterwards, I found that it requires a different soil and a different aspect. Full speed, I galloped back to the hamlet of Spelon Cato and inquired for the owner of this olive El Dorado. Signor Desio della Croce, owner of all this lovely slope and of large estates extending as far as the road to Corte, in fact, the chief proprietor of the neighbourhood. He was, said the peasant with some pride, a true descendant of the great race of Kinarka, foremost in the island annals for a thousand years, and of whom was the famous Guidesi della Roca, count and judge of Corsica, six hundred years ago. At the sound of his name, Guidesi opened his great sleepy eyes and pricked his ears. I promised not to interrupt, but he gave no such pledge. Let the Kinarchese blood go for its full value, but it was worth something to the Della Croce to be descended also from the Tuscan Malaspina, for the lands of those great Marcheses were now in possession of the Signor Desio. And the Signor has such a daughter, a young maiden, ah, Madonna, the loveliest girl in Corsica, and the vine dresser crossed himself. As I listened to all this information, I began to look through my unused credentials, which I always carried. It struck me that this name of Della Croce was quite familiar to me, though I knew not how, until a letter in the sprawling hand of young Lawrence Daldy fell out from among Peter's crabbed characters. Lawrence Daldy, my mother's younger son, was now in full career as a pigeon and a guardsman, spending at full gallop his dead father's money. These Daldys were of Italian origin, the true name being Daldis, which after some years of English life they had naturalised into Daldy. And now I recollected that when we Vaughan boys scorned them as ignoble sons of commerce, they used to brag about their kinship to the ancient Della Croce. Riding up the forest hill, on whose western bluff stands boldly the grey old tower of the Malaspinas, I began, of course, to make forecasts about the character of my host. My host I knew he needs must be, for Corsica is all of the world the most hospitable spot. Although by this time well acquainted with the simple island habits, I could not but expect to find a man of stateliness and surroundings, of stiffness and some arrogance. Now the sun was setting, and the western fire from off the sea glanced in spears of reddening gold into the solemn, time-worn keep. All things looked majestic, but a deal too lonely. Where was I to apply? How was I to get in? The narrow doorway, overhung with the wreck of some portcullis, was blocked instead with a sort of mantlet like the Roman vinea. The loopholes on the ground tier were boarded almost to the top. The high windows, such as they were, had their rough shutters closed. Everything betokened a state of siege and fear. Two or three magnificent chestnuts, which must have commanded the front of the tower, had been cut down and added to the defences of the approach. Over these I managed at last to leap my horse, who was by no means a perfect hunter, and there I halted at a loss how to proceed. 
I had been long enough in Corsica to know, even without a certain ominous gleam from a loophole, and the view in transverse section of a large double-barrelled gun, that the owner of this old mansion was now in the pleasant state of vendetta. Expecting every moment to be shot and nothing said about it, I waved my letter as a white flag furiously above my head. Presently that frightful muzzle was withdrawn and the slide pushed back to reconnoitre me at leisure. I tried for the first time in my life to look like a real Briton. My Corsican ambition was already on the wane. So I sat my horse and waited, and what came was worth a thousand years of waiting. Round the bastion of the tower, under the rich magnolia bloom, towards me glided through the rosy shadow the loveliest being that ever moved outside the gates of heaven. She seemed not to walk, but waft along, like the pearly nautilus. A pink mandial of lightest gauze lit the sable of her clustering hair, and wreathing round her graceful head deepened the tinge of the nestling cheeks. The lithe faldetta of white cashmere, thrown hastily over the shoulders, half concealed the flowing curves of the slender, supple form, half betrayed them as it followed every facile motion. But when she smiled, oh, Clara, I would have leaped from her father's towers or into the black caves of the Restonica for one smile of hers. The dark fringed luster of her eyes seemed to dance with golden joy, trusting, hoping, loving all things, pleasure pleased at pleasing. And the gleesome arch of her laughing lips that never shaped evil word. O oh, my lily, my own lily, I shall see you soon again. My dear Clara, I ought to know better. I am ashamed of myself. And after so many years, but at the first glance of Fiordalisa, my fate was fixed for this life and the other. I never had loved before. I never had cared to look at a girl. In fact, I despised them all. Now I paid for that contemptuous folly. Loving at one glance, loving once, for all, for ever. My heart stood still like the focus of a hurricane. My speech in every power but that of vision failed me. I dared not try to leave the saddle. Such a trembling took me. It was a visitation unknown in our foggy plains, scoffed at by our prosy race, but known full well in southern climes, as the sunstroke of love. My own darling, I can call her nothing less, my own delicious darling was quite startled at me. Whether she had a like visitation in a milder form is more than I can say, but I hope with all my heart she had, for then, as the southern tale recites, God placed her hand in mine. How I got my horse tied up, how I followed her through the side entrance, and returned her father's greeting, I have not the least idea. All I know is that she smiled and I wanted nothing more. But I could not bear to see her in the true Homeric fashion still maintained in Corsica, waiting on us like a common servant, with her beautiful arched feet glancing under the brown pelone and her tapering white arms lay demurely on her bosom. Then, at her father's signal, how she flew for the purple grapes or the fragrant broccio. But do what she would, it seemed to become her more than all she had done before. As that form of love and elegance flitted through the simple room, and those lustrous heavenly eyes beamed with hospitable warmth, Signor Desio della Croce, careworn man with beard of snow, seemed at times no little proud of his sweet and only child, but was too proud to show his pride. As for me, he must have thought that I spoke very poor Italian. End of Book Four Chapter Nine